could just give you answers to this. I could give you methods and just show you right from the outset. But when I learned this the first time, and I was just having someone explain it to me, and they're like, oh, well, here is what you do. I learned it, but I didn't understand why, and it was very frustrating to me, because I was like, why would you do that? Well, what makes you think that? So I'm actually gonna lead you through a bit of a scenic route, as it were. Um, scenic is a bit of a, a, a very fancy way of saying it. I'm going to lead you through some mistakes, some ways to not do this, so you understand when we get to the way you do do it, Oh, of course you have to do it. Because I remember what happened when we tried it the other ways, and it sucked. Okay, good morning. So, have a look at this with me. And we've looked at partial fractions for a, a little bit now, and the idea is not that complicated. You have a look at your denominator, and what, what do you do with the denominator? Factorize. Yeah, once you've got it factorized, which I have given it to you in a factorized form already, once it is factorized, you've got like, say, one, two, or maybe three factors, factors on the denominator, and you say, come in. Give money. You say, okay, well, I am going to hypothesize that the partial fractions I can break it up into are something over one factor, plus something over another factor, plus however many times you do it for however many factors you have. Does that make sense? So when you have a look at like something like this, it is not unreasonable to assume I can take a similar approach. So let's see what happens. Okay, let's try it. Let's let this... Um, I'll write it all over again. Let's try and take a similar approach to how we did it before. Okay? So I've got one factor, I've got two, so that means I'm going to suggest that there will be two partial fractions. Right? Here's my first one. Here's my second one. Now, like I said, some of you who have encountered this before will look at this and say, that's not what you're supposed to do, <laughs> okay? I would challenge you to say, well, why? Why is it that this, can you explain? And I'll, I will get to an explanation. I just want you to have that turning around in your head. If you know that this is wrong, the real question is, why is it wrong, okay? Let's see what happens, because this is the way that maths is born. You give something a go. What do we usually do at this point, once I've written down the first two fractions, what do I actually do? Yeah, I need to combine so that I've got the denominators the same, and then I can compare numerators. Let's go ahead, let's do that. So I'm going to get this to be like so. And at this point, I have a choice. You might remember. Because I've now got my numerator, sorry, I've now got my denominators the same, I could do something like, say, let x equal 2. Once I compare just the numerators, that'll make this term disappear. I explain why I don't think that's the best method, but it still works. Textbooks use it, and it, it sort of does make sense if you ignore the denominators for a little while. I could do that. I'm going to go back with my normal method and compare the coefficients. What do I need to do to compare coefficients? I'm not quite ready yet. Yeah, I do need to expand and get all the x squared terms, the x terms, and the constant terms. Okay, with that, so let's just go ahead and do that. Let's see if we can do it right off the bat. How many x squared terms do you see? Look carefully. One. I just see the one. It's that guy, right? No x squared terms are going to come from here, so I'm just going to write that down. Like so. Okay. Um, the x terms, how many x terms do you see? I see an ax here and a bx there. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to... Factorize that. That's how many x's I've got. Yeah? Okay. And constant terms? Yeah, there's a minus 2a there, and there's a 2b there. Just so that I don't have the negative out the front, I'm going to write it like so. Are you content with that? Have I got my x squared, my x to the 1s, my x to the 0 And there's my denominator, happily sitting in it. Okay. Now you have a look at this, right? So because I mentioned I've got um, three different terms to compare, one, two, three, I'm going to get three simultaneous equations out of this. Hmm. Okay, let's see what happens. I'm going to write down, I'm going to compare by comparison of coefficients. And then I'm going to go x squared, x ones, x naught. Okay, so how many x squared terms do I have on left? Answer, four of them. So how many do I have on the right hand side? Look at B. Okay. Huh. That doesn't usually happen. That's okay. Let's just see. Let's just proceed. How many x terms do I have on the left hand side? Zero. zero. So zero equals a plus b. And then I say, okay, well my constant term now, I've got eight and I've got two b minus two a. Yep. Okay. One, two, 
read. Okay. Now, so far, I've just done the normal process that I've gone through before, but now I've run into a problem, haven't I? Yes, that look on your face is exactly the look you should have on your face. What's gone wrong? How can you tell something has gone wrong? There are three equations that two variables. First problem I notice is, like we notice this, like, huh? Why, why am I getting three equations to solve for two variables? This is not just weird, this is a problem, because the problem that flows out of that, of course, is well, you just start trying to solve them, right? You don't have to solve for B, it's right there. So what does that tell you about A? Negative. Must be negative four. So you wait, hold on a second. So now I have some values for A and B already. So then you look to the third equation. And you get 16. And you say, oh, wait a second. Um, two times negative four, right? That's, that's uh, sorry, wait, no. Did you get it right? Yeah, that's four. Two times four. Minus two minus times two negative eight. Oh, yeah, of course. Sorry, I've, this is, that's that. So you've got eight, and then you've got minus negative eight. You've got 16 on this right-hand side. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, so problem number one, you might even like to write these down. Problem number one is, I have too many equations for too few, few variables. We usually identify this problem in the reverse direction. We're like, ooh, I've got lots of variables to solve for, unknowns, um, but I don't have enough equations, don't have enough information to solve. But here I have the opposite problem, right? Second problem is that uh, it doesn't work, <laughs> precisely because of that reason. Well, I'd just have two of the equations, any two of these would be okay, right? They'd have a solution. The reason why is because any pair of straight lines, right, because that's what these are, so long as they're not parallel, they'll always have a solution somewhere. But when you go for three, no guarantees. If they're not all concurrent, there won't be a solution. There's a third problem, which kind of explains why we ended up with this problem in the first place, right? Because remember we wrote this down and we said, huh, that's a bit unusual. That doesn't usually happen. Can anyone see where it comes from? It's one of the lines earlier that we wrote down. Yeah. Is it because when you um, split, when you reduce a fraction into its partial fractions, the a and the b have to yeah, so you're only reducing them by you're only reducing the degree of the denominator by one thing that you think. Hmm. Kind of. Okay. Now you're actually going towards the answer already, but that still doesn't explain why it's wrong. I will get to that answer. Let me try and show you what's sort of weird about this, right? The first thing that I noticed when I started writing down these simultaneous equations is, hey look, B is just sitting there. It doesn't care what the other new pronumeral is. Do you notice that? And the reason why is because when I wrote this down, you're like, oh, there's only one x squared term. There's only one x squared term. Where does it come from? And the answer is, it's come from this, turning this into a common denominator. So it's come from here. In other words, this A over here is contributing nothing to the x squared. That's wrong. It shouldn't. These two are supposed to interact with each other. That's the point of these equations, right? What we've got is too simple. It's too simple. Um, there should be some x squared term appearing over here as well, and then you'll get a balance here, and then it will solve. Okay? So in order to get an x squared term out of the other thing, hmm, how am I going to do this? Okay? So this is approach number one, and it didn't work just by trying the previous way. I'm going to try another approach. So this was... Um, do it, do it in red. This is number one. Okay. And this is the reason why mathematicians have rules. It's not because we've just decided most of the time. It's because we tried the other things and it's like, well, you end up with self inconsistencies. It's contradictory. So here comes number two. Okay. Now I'm just going to try this just for the sake of giving it a go, but we're going to run into some similar problems. Okay. It all started with our original assumption. Let's try a different one. Okay. If I let and I promise this one will not take as long as the previous one to work out that there was a problem. Uh, whoops, let's let that equal to. Okay, now I'm going to introduce a different pair of partial fractions, okay? Do you remember before when you have the degree of the top and the bottom matching? You're like, oh, well, you can't do it in this way. So we added one, do you remember that? So I can just introduce a different kind of identity. Here's the identity I'm gonna try. I'm gonna leave this as A. And instead, I want an extra, I want like terms of higher powers to appear. So I'm going to add a higher power over here. I'm going to call this bx plus c. And it's over, what is it? Over? X minus 2. Okay. Now, the reason why I'm trying this is because if I introduce this, then when I multiply through by here, I'll get an x squared term. Maybe that will be useful to me. Okay. Now, this is all I need to write to show that this is not going to work. Right? Like, I'm, I'm in a second, I'm going to show you the third approach, which will work, right? But why doesn't this second approach work? What's wrong with it? Because you're introducing, like, an x cubed term, which is not an 
not even existed. On yeah, that. okay, now, there's no problem with introducing terms that don't exist just on its own. For example, when I did this, right, and when we do it sometimes, I've got no x terms, but that's okay. That's, that sometimes forms an important part of your simultaneous equations. In itself, that's not an issue. But when you look here, how would you solve this x cubed problem? Well, the x cubed is going to come from b, right? Do you see that? You're going to get bx cubed. So the only way to solve it is to make b equal to 0. But if you do that, you're in exactly the same boat that you started with before. You've just labeled it with a different letter, right? So this solution is no better than the one I tried before. So I need a different way. Here comes number three. Okay. 